Welcome to day two of physics two. Um, yeah, now actually really getting into things. I mean, I did a little bit of physics last time, but today we're gonna really get into this chapter. Well, um, we're gonna basically do it the same way that we did physics one. Um, I'm only gonna really lecture Monday and Wednesday, Fridays, for example, problems. We'll talk about that more at the end of today, but I'm gonna finish the chapter today. Um, before we get into it though, um, those of you who had me last semester, I had exams were done with that whole thing where I gave the PDF for the new worked on paper and uploaded to a drop thing. I'm gonna change how that works a little bit. It's still gonna be you work in paper and upload it, but it's gonna be the same type of setup as the, oh, my cat is visiting. It's gonna be the same type of setup as the um, homeworks and labs, that same Moodle quiz thing that'll let me do a few other things that make my life easier. But um, when I go, when I put up last semester's exam to study from, I'll put it in that format so you can see it. I'll talk about that a lot more when we get close. So we got a month to them. Where I left off though, was I was talking about how to charge things. And I was talking about how to um, add a charge to something by conduction. That if you take a charged object, put it against a not charged object, you can transfer some charge. And I want to start today with talking about another way to add charge to an object, which is charging by induction. See, conduct, charging by conduction involves, as I said, taking two things, putting them together, splitting the charge. But you actually don't need to touch an object to cause a charge. Um, if I open up the video of the electrograph that I was doing, or electroscope, I mean, you can see that as I get close, that gold flake moves a little bit. It's not a lot, but just moves a little bit. And then I touched it. Um, the reason why is if you bring a charged object near a non-charged, especially a conductor, what happens is the charges inside of it will move around. That if I bring a negatively charged rod near a uniformly charged field, like in point B, all of the electrons are gonna try to move as far away as possible. If you then touch the sphere and ground it, the charge rod you brought close will chase them all away. And you can then go and remove the ground and remove the thing that is doing the charging by induction and leave a charge. That you can actually cause something to become charged just by bringing a charge object close enough to it, grounding, and then removing your hand kind of a neat idea. Um, you could also have objects act as if they are charged without having a charge. Uh, this is called polarization, especially polarization of charge. I talked about the balloon and I was like rubbing against my shoe and trying to stick it to myself last class. Um, instead, I'm just going to do it in a video again and my mouse disappeared. There we go. Um, that if I take this balloon, doesn't normally stick, but if I rub it up against my shirt and put it to the whiteboard, it'll stay stuck to it. Oh, well, not very well. I should probably look at the videos before I decide to use them again. There we go. It sticks to it. There was not originally any charge on the whiteboard. The whiteboard is not a charged object, but by, at, by giving the balloon a static charge, I can get it to stick as if it was a charged object. The reason for this is the same as the reason for the charging by induction. Um, if you bring a charged object near the whiteboard in that case, it'll move around the charges inside of it. And when they move around, what's going to happen is that the like charges are going to go further away. The, the charges that are not the same are going to get closer to the edge. And that's going to cause it to have a strong attractive force holding it in place. Okay. Now, it's interesting to say that the, if the total charge is zero, that it still would get attracted like that. Excuse me. Not used to talking this much. It's weird to say that if the total charge is zero, it still get attracted. But the reason why is that the closer charges will apply a more larger attractive force than the further away charges. What this means is that the closer charged objects are together, the stronger the force. And this is actually can be quantized because, yep, time to get into the math with something called Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says the force between any two charged particles. It is a vector, 
because it's a force. Um, but the direction, I'll come back to the direction of the force, but the force F in Newton's, just like any other force, goes as Coulomb's constant times the charge of one object, the charge of the other object over the distance between them squared. Um, in this equation, all once again, it's just a distance. It's not a radius or anything. Q stands for charge. In case of E, it's just a constant. 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per, center, per Coulomb squared. Um, you'll sometimes see this equation written differently. Coulomb's constant is not necessarily a, it is a fundamental constant of nature. My cat is right in front of the computer, but it's not necessarily the world's most important one. Um, there is something else called the, called, there's a different constant that is a lot more important in physics, but it happens to end up to the fact that one over four pi epsilon sub naught equals k sub e. Well, one over four pi epsilon sub naught is epsilon sub naught is the actual fundamental constant here. So you'll sometimes see this written as one over four pi epsilon sub naught q1 q2 over r squared. I'm not going to bother doing it that way. I decided just to give you k sub e because to make life easy. But yeah, that's the force between two charged particles. Now. This equation might look a little similar because you've seen an equation that looks just like it back in physics one. When we talked about the force due to gravity, the force due to gravity was a constant times mass one, mass two over the distance squared. Where the force due to uh, um, electric, sorry, no, the force due to charged particles is just the same structure. Um, this is not a coincidence. The fact that multiple fundamental forces in nature work as this inverse square law um, is a common thing that will pop up a few different spots. But um, yeah, it has the same form. There is some differences though. Um, force is that the Coulomb force is much, much, much stronger. Keep in mind capital G for gravity is like 10 to the negative 11th, where Coulomb's constant for, force, for electrostatic force is 10 to the positive ninth. So it's like 10 to the 20th times bigger. Also, um, gravity can only attract, but Coulomb's force can attract or repel. If it's positive and positive, repel. Negative and negative, repel. Positive and negative, attract. Now, you do have to be careful with this equation though, since the force is a vector. So, you, but Q1 and Q2, the, the, whether they're positive or negative has little to do with the direction of the force, or actually it's everything to do with the direction of the force, but not directly, directly. This equation really only gives the magnitude of the force. It will not give the direction of the force. The direction of the force will depend on the, situ pl the placement of the two charged particles. If my charged particles are here and here, and let's say they're both positive, they'll be pushing out right along X. But if they're here and here, they'll be pushing out just along y. This won't tell you what direction the force is in. I recommend always working in absolute values. Don't worry if q is positive, q is negative when solving for value for f. Just get the magnitude of f. And once you have the magnitude of f, then look at the situation and say, okay, is this attractive or repulsive? And then in what direction? Is it, uh, is it in the positive x or the positive y? Is it in the negative x or the negative y? Or is that some weird angle, which is going to be a pain in the ass? So here's the both versions. As I said, I recommend doing using the what's to the right and then just thinking about directions. So I'm going to do two example problems, a simple one and one that's more like what you would see on homework and exams and things like that. For the simple one. I don't know why they don't show up. A hydrogen atom consists of one proton and one electron. And they're separated by one angstrom, also known as one times 10 to the negative 10 meters. See, the reason a hydrogen atom stays together is that there's a force pulling the two together. And since it has some velocity, it just spins in a circle. This goes back to centripetal acceleration and all those things covered from physics one. But my question is, what's the force holding them together? If it's one proton or one electron, separated by that distance. Now, I don't expect you to know the charge of a proton or an electron. I would always give that, but there you go. 
the charge of a proton is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. For an electron, it's negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. If I want to find the magnitude or the, yeah, if I want to find the magnitude of this force, there's my equation. Well, K sub E is coulombs constant. It's just really a plug and chunk. You want the magnitude of the force? It's coulombs constant times the magnitude of one charge, the magnitude of the other charge over the distance between them squared. And you can solve. Now, I know looking at this, that that doesn't give me anything in direction, but I can see it's a positive and negative, so it must be an attractive force. And there it is. Any questions on that before I make this complicated? So would both a positive and a positive or a negative and a negative result in a repulsive? Yep, exactly. All right. Anyone else? My cats don't normally show up when I'm teaching, but they are swarming me. Okay. Let's look at a more complicated version. Let's say I have an equilateral triangle, each side being five meters long. And I have at the top, which I called A, a two microcoulomb charge. Bottom left, a seven microcoulomb charge. And bottom right, a negative 3.5 microcoulomb charge. Let's solve for the force on charge A. Well, if I want to solve for the force on charge A, this is, this is F equals MA free body diagram stuff. That's what we're going to be going with. We're going to solve for each force, make free body diagrams, put them together. We've done this repeatedly. See, I'm going to figure out if I want to know the net charge on, I'm sorry, the net force on A, I'm going to need to find how much force B adds. And then I'm, and then I'm going to have to figure out how many force C adds. Find the force from B to A, find the force from C to A. And once I have both, add them up. But it's vectors, so adding them up probably is going to be complicated. Now, first off, I gave stuff in microcoulombs. Um, a microcoulomb is 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, so I can convert them. And I also know if I want to find the force of these charges, that's Coulomb's law with that constant. And so I want to find each force. And I'm going to start with the force between A and B, because why not do that first? If I want to find the force between A and B, the force between A and B is Coulomb's constant, the charge of A, the charge of B over the distance squared, which means it's Coulomb's constant, force charge of A, charge of B, distance squared. And I can do that math. That force is 0 0.00503 newtons, and I know it's a repulsive force. That's because they're both positive. It must be repulsive. So it points that away. We good so far? I'm going to have yep. to clear this out to make space, so. OK. Let's look at the force between charge A and C. Between A and C, same equation. Oop, there should be a C here. There should be A comma C. I'm sorry, that's on me. And I would plug in the same. And I once again, this should be A comma C. I would need to fix that. Copy and pasting. Fixed it there. And I can get the value. That value is 0 0.00252 newtons. Now, this one's an attractive force because it's between a positive and a negative. Once again, I ignored the negative side of my force equation. I put absolute value of it all. But I'm like, hey, it's attractive. So it must be pointing that way. Good so far? Yep. Now we're going to make it complicated then, because I want to know the net force on charge A. And I'm like, there's one this way. Well, I grab these guys. I say, there's one this way, and there's one that way. So, got to, well, probably that way for you, because I think it's reversed. So, what's the net? And so, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, hey, it's just two vectors, just geometry. Um, I can say if the angle down here 
if the angles inside an equilateral triangle are 60 degrees, I don't know if that's something you guys all know by memory. It's something I had to learn back in the day. Um, if not, I, we can prove it, or I would probably give that angle, but I did give it here. It says 60 degrees. If that angle in the bottom left is 60 degrees, that means this angle up here is 60 degrees. And so I can say, okay, that force between, that force between A and B, it's up at an angle. I'll break it into components. If I want to add two vectors, that's components. That's just find the X component, find the Y component, add them up. That this force AB has an X component of force AB cosine theta and has a Y component of force AB sine theta. I can say for AC, that's also at 60 degrees, just 60 degrees down. Which, there you go, they show up in the photo. So I can find the magnitude of each one of those too. And I can say, okay, that's the magnitude of each of these four vectors. I'm gonna go from these two to split up to the X and Y for this guy, the X and Y of that guy. Once again, I'm not doing that in too much detail because you've seen this before. This just add two vectors. But if you want to find the net force, that is straight up physics one, right? Forces in Y is up minus down. The forces in X is right minus left. And so I'll say, okay, the force in X, they're both to the right, I'll just add them up. The forces in Y, up minus down. And there we go. I know that this force has a net force in X of 0 0.00378 Newtons and in Y of 0 0.00218 Newtons. Any questions? I'm doing a lot of things that I'm assuming you remember from physics one slash I kind of reviewed Monday. Are we good? Did I lose anybody? Okay. Well, if we have the X and Y, once you have the X and Y, then you can get the magnitude and direction. Magnitude, Pythagorean theorem. Direction, inverse tangent of Y over X. And there we go. That would be the net force on vector, oh, sorry, on charge A. It would be 0 0.00436 Newtons at 30 degrees. There's this other slight issue on this slide. Sorry, I'm going to fix it real fast. Any questions? Uh, not currently. OK. <sighs> now, this is just forces. Let's think about this through logically. If I have a charged particle and a second charged particle, there'll be a force between them. But if I start changing out the second charged particle, basically I make one set charged particle set in a place and start moving around the second one. Well, ooh, I just realized, I think I skipped the video. Oh, well. Um, only one thing will change, right? Like if I start removing QB, a lot of the equation stays the same. And for this reason, we still have to refer to things by their electric fields. Anytime you have a charged particle, it has what is called an electric field. It's invisible, oops. It's invisible, you can't see it, but it can be felt like gravity. The fact that you're always being pulled down to Earth, that's always gravitational field. But likewise, everything has an electric field. And if you bring another charge close to it, it'll get either pulled away or pushed towards it if it interacts with the field. Interestingly, the field is drawn with direction, either pointing out or pointing in. Now the convection, convention, sorry, is that you, field goes away from a positive charge towards a negative charge. This goes back to the whole Benjamin Franklin had it wrong thing. If this was backwards, if it was oh, towards a negative charge and away from a positive charge, a lot of the math would come out easier. Well, we can just define everything as having an electric field. 
based off the charge. Now, electric field uses the symbol E and has units of newtons per coulomb. Um, fixing those parentheses. Now, pretty sure I have a video for this. Let me check since I skipped the Van de Graaff balloon lines. What I have here is two charged plates. Well, right now they're not really charged, but I have two plates. And what I'm doing is I'm putting a current through them. As I do that, you can see these little metal shavings in here are starting to form lines coming across. The reason they're starting to form lines is because they're tracing out the electric field. And that when I create something with a positive side and negative side, you can actually, if you put metal in, see the electric field in practice. All that is is this idea that it points towards or away. Now, if you just have a charged particle, the electric field just pushes it away from it everywhere. Um, by definition, how an electric field is found is you place a point charge and you move it around, find the magnitude of the force everywhere, and take that force and divide by the charge. That's how it's done by definition. You can map out the electric field by just moving that force around and measuring its forces. That means mathematically to find the electric field from something is Coulomb's constant times the charge over the distance squared. There's only one charge here because the electric field is independent of the second charge. It's just what field does that point charge make? Okay. Now, this gets into weird things with direction again. Electric field like um, Electric field, like force, is a vector. You need to keep track of what it is. But keep in mind that just if Q is positive, doesn't mean it's positive. If Q is negative, it doesn't mean it's negative. It's, if it's positive, it's away. And if the charge is negative, it's towards. And so same idea as before. I just always take the absolute value and then mathematically find, OK, what is the electric field here? By working out the vectors. Are the vectors pointing towards this? Are they away from this? And adding up the vector separately. I'll do an example to show what I mean in a second. But really, when solving for electric field, just worry about magnitude and then use logic and thinking to draw your arrows to say, is it towards or away? Um, here's another thing about it that I think. Nope, that's ladle. Sorry. I'm going to say it later, so I won't bother saying it now. OK? So I'm going to do another example problem. Let's say I got this box. And I have this box where there's a 1 Coulomb charge in the bottom left and a negative 2 Coulomb charge in the upper right. I could say, what's the force between them? But I'm going to do something kind of weird. I'm going to say, what's the electric field at the exact center of this? That what is the electric field? Yeah, right. Why does that not do what I told you to do? No. Stupid computer, do what I'm telling you to do. What's the electric field right there? OK. Now, if I want to find the electric field right there, I first got to figure out the distance between this and either charge. Uh, but I can figure out the distance of this whole thing. That if there's one meter along x, one meter along y, the distance between them, just Pythagorean theorem, is going to be the square root of 2. And therefore, the distance from one of them to the center, the point we're measuring, is just going to be half that. So I want to get the electric field. The electric field from each charge separately is kq over o. Now, note this equation is just the electric field of a charge. And I'm saying, what's the electric field from both of these charges? I have this one Coulomb charge. I got this negative two Coulomb charge. What's the electric field? But it's not saying, hey, I got two charges. What are we doing? If you have a more complex situation, like so, what you're going to want to do is find the electric field from each and then add them up. What is the electric field from the one Coulomb charge? And what direction is it in? What is the electric field from the negative 2 Coulomb charge? And what direction is it in? And then vector add them together. You see, I can say for the 1 Coulomb charge, the electric field, 
Coulomb's constant, one Coulomb over that distance squared. So it's 8.99 times 10 to the ninth times one divided by the square root of two over two squared. But the square root of two over two squared is, is a half. And so the electric field there is 1.8 times 10 to the 10th newtons per Coulomb. Now, this was a positive charge. And anytime you have a positive charge, the electric field pushes away from it. So I can say that electric field pushes that way. This makes sense so far? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was completely ignoring the green charge here, as if it doesn't exist. I'm going to add that in a second, but this is just saying what electric field does the one Coulomb charge make? And now that I have that, I can say, okay, cool. That's all well and good. Let's look at the negative two Coulomb charge. Did, sorry, something else changed up there. I got to fix that too. If I'm going to look at the negative two Coulomb charge, oh, that's what I got. I got a B and G for blue and green. I'll plug in the numbers for that guy and do some math and get the value. Now, this one was negative. And something always pushes, the electric fields always point towards negative charges. So the direction for this one is parallel to the other one. They both push up to the exact same direction. They both push that way because it's they're, they're pointing together. And so what I can say is, OK, the direction, it's that way for both. Now, vector addition is really easy when all the vectors point in the same direction, right? I can say these are the two vectors. But it'd be like, you know, instead of all finding the x component, finding all the y component, they're all in the same direction. So I'm just going to add them together. And I'm just going to say, cool, it's that one plus that one. Why break the components? And I'll say the electric field is 5.4 times 10 to the 10th Newton per Coulombs. And I should include the direction. It's at a 45 degree angle. I know it's at a 45 degree angle because it's going along this piece bisecting our cube. Really doing force um, Coulomb force problems and electric field problems, it's basically the same thing. Just one you have to multiply by another Q. And that's the difference. Side note, we're probably going to end early today now that I look at this. Oh, I am apparently going fast. I need to slow down. Um, yeah, I just got a question in the chat. Could we break it down from an, from an angle? Yeah, we could. We could have gone and found the x component of each one, the y component of each other, each one, added them up and gone back. Um, I, instead of doing that, just said, hey, instead of our normal coordinate system, let's use that coordinate system um, and just push them in the same direction. I mean, I know that's going up at a 45 degree angle just because, once again, we're splitting a square in half. But yeah, you could. Now, this, it's all well and good to say at this point, that's the electric field. What people normally talk about is electric field lines. So here's the thing. You can, if you find the electric field at all spots around something, you can map what its electric field looks like at all points. This is when I should have played that video before. And the electric field at all points is just showing exactly how it goes. Now, a simple, just a positive charge, it just points us out in all directions radially. But when you start introducing other charges, the electric field lines will curve and bend. Um, your first lab, which is going to be released on Banco Hall tomorrow, and is due a week from tomorrow. Um, yeah, you don't need to log on during lab time. It's just up there. Um, it's going to have you mapping out an electric field, electric field lines. Um, but it's just a way of showing how the electric field pushes. Of note, they always are directed from positive to negative. Um, also, if you have areas where the lines are close together, like if I look at this middle diagram, 
in between the two charges, the lines are really close, while further out, they're more spread out. Wherever the electric field lines are closer together, that's where the field is the strongest. And there's a few rules when making these. One is that the lines can never cross each other. If you have electric field lines crossing, something's wrong. It doesn't actually make sense. Now, what these electric field lines tell you is if at all points there or what the electric field is, well, keep in mind, we defined electric field as electric field is force over charge of a test charge. And so we can rearrange it. And we can say, if you take a charged particle and you put it in an electric field, the force that feels is the electric field times charge. And so what this means is anytime you take a charged particle and place it in an electric field, it'll follow these lines. It'll follow the electric field lines. That the force is just going to go, and it'll just take those paths. A positive charge will follow the path directly. A negative charge will follow it in the opposite direction. Now, this goes back to the whole Benjamin Franklin backwards thing, because we now know that positive charged particles don't really move. Electrons do. And so since really all moving charge is electrons, that means all moving charge travels in the opposite direction of our, uh, of our field lines. Think of it as just the fact that if you include sign here, you're doing the E times a negative Q when you put an electron in. This is, this is why it's backwards, because electrons are what go. We point the force this, we point the electric field this way, meaning something's gonna go that way. But yeah, anytime you put a, pos a charged particle in an electric field, it'll whip from one side to the other. And if you start adding more and more charged particles, you can make some pretty complex situations. But all charged particles put in an electric field will follow the electric field lines. Questions? OK. Now, here's a really neat thing. Let's say you have a complex electric field, and you shove a piece of metal into the middle of it. Like you just put a piece of metal in the electric field. Well, you know what? Let's go back to my videos for a second. Come on. We talked about the Van de Graaff generator, right? What's happening with this Van de Graaff generator is I'm building a charge that's going around this guy, which means there's an electric field coming off around it. But we didn't really talk about if there's an electric field coming out around it, what's happening inside of it hasn't really been mentioned. Right? There's charge on the outside, but what's happening in the actual metal? I realize I skipped the video. I'll do, I'll do an extra bonus video at the end. Anytime you, um, as long as there's no motion of charge, well, let's phrase that. If there is no motion of charge, if the charge isn't moving, if something's in electrostatic equilibrium, but if you take a conductor and if you put a conductor in a electric field, what will happen is the charges inside of it will move right at the get-go. And they'll push as far as they can in the conductor along the electric field lines as they can. They'll do this because the charges can move freely. And so let's say, if you look at this bottom right picture, I want to talk about that one, that if I put a metal ring around this proton, all of the electrons in are going to try to fly to the inner ring. And all of the protons are are going to be left without electrons on the outer bit of it. What's going to happen, though, is that the net electric field inside this will actually be zero. Because what happens is when it hits the conductor is that it will create its own electric field inside to balance it out. And any time you put a conductor in an electric field, there will be no electric field inside the conductor. It'll be at the edges, but it'll be a small break. This bottom right picture shows the electric field just disappears in that metal ring and then reappears when it leaves it. And all of the charge will be entirely on the surface. This other picture, the upper right, shows is a charged wheel-shaped piece of conductor. And the electric field lines are all leaving the outside but there's no electric field lines inside. And that's the same with my Van de Graaff generator. That there's no electric field inside that piece, it all is right on the very edge going out. Now, to explain this, 
let's say an electric field like that. And I put a piece of conductor in that looks like this. What happens is that once again, because the charges move inside, inside that conductor, it'll have its own electric field, its own electric field that balances. And here's the neat thing. Let's say I had a parallel electric field, something looking like um, this guy, where they're just parallel going across. And I put a conductor in. This will warp the electric field. And even though there's no electric field inside the conductor, it'll change the pattern of the electric field. You see, wherever electric field hits a conductor, it'll always hit it perpendicularly, that they will bend and warp. So they hit the surface of the metal perfectly perpendicular. And yes, no electric field is inside of that metal, but it does change it. But this is the really cool thing, because let's say that metal sphere was hollow, closer to that right hand picture. If that metal sphere was hollow, there would still be no electric field inside of it. Because once again, due to conductor, the electric field would be moved around the very, very, very edge. And so if you have an electric field, and yet don't want there to be one in a spot, if you surround it in metal, what happens is that no electric field will go inside. It'll go around the edges. Now, there's a fancy name for this. It is called a Faraday cage. A Faraday cage is a way to protect something from electric shocks. So my GIF at the bottom is a drone wrapped with wire netting, um, getting zapped by lightning. And my other picture is someone getting zapped by lightning surrounded by metal. You don't actually have to fully surround it. All you have is have enough metal to wrap around it. But in a Faraday cage, no electric field will go in the middle. And this can shield something. This is a way to talk about electric shielding. And so if you have, if you're gonna have something putting up with a large charge, putting out a large amount of power, electric power, and you don't want it to be touched, you just put a cage around it and it won't be. Um, interesting, annoying fact on this. This house I'm in right now, I my house has aluminum siding. Because as aluminum siding, it's means it's surrounded by metal, it's surrounded by aluminum. That makes it a Faraday cage. Well, radio waves and light waves deal with electric fields. We'll cover that later. I have a Wi-Fi router right next to one wall of the house. If I walk to the other side of my house through all my internal walls, my Wi-Fi works. If I walk outside, I have no Wi-Fi. The reason why is this aluminum siding makes a Faraday cage that I can't get internet to travel outside because that's a type of radio wave, which is a type of electric field. Once again, we'll cover the relationship later on. And so, yeah, it doesn't go. If you, um, if you ever want something to get not interacted with at all by electricity or radio waves or light, well, light can still pass through if it's uh, something like this because it's too small, you can stop it. Just wrap it in metal. It's the best way to shield stuff. Uh, Tim, I just saw your question. Could lead-based paint have a similar effect? <sighs> I don't know off the top of my head. Um, honestly, I am young enough that lead-based paint was already pretty gone before I've been alive and everything with lead-based paint keeps getting replaced. Um, it, if you wrap it in lead, yes. I don't know the how much lead is in lead-based paint. Like if it's enough, basically to do it, you need a continuous coverage. Even with the cage has holes in it, but all pieces are attached to each other, right? If I was instead of making continuous cage to put half a cage and then half a cage and not connect the two, it wouldn't work. So I don't, it depends if lead-based paint has enough lead in it to have a continuous covering of lead. I would guess it would, if it's painted on the metal, then yes. If it's painted on the metal, then the metal does it. doesn't matter. But I would think lead-based paint would probably have a similar effect. But once again, I don't know. I don't know what percentage of lead-based paint is lead. That, that's what's holding me up. It'll depend on how much lead is in there. Okay. So 
Um, that is actually the end of this chapter. Um, so I am going to stop 10 minutes early. Oh, I said I'd show a bonus video. I forgot one of my videos, so I'm going to show it now. Um, I talked about when I charged the balloons, how it could stick to stuff. Fun fact, if I take a charged balloon and throw it out of Van de Graaff generator, it does funny things. This was just me charging another balloon and just throwing it at the Van de Graaff generator. This is the whole idea of the charge is repelling and it just keeps pushing it away. I forgot to play that video. But uh, yeah, so that is the end of the chapter. So for those of you who haven't had me full, which I think is only one person in the room, but a few watching videos, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna lecture Monday and Wednesday and Friday will be for example problems. In class, when you had me in class, I used to spend 25 minutes having you guys solve problems and then 25 minutes me going over them. I'm not gonna waste online Zoom time watching you guys solve problems. So here's the setup. Every Friday at exactly 3.50, an example problem will load on, oops, that's not what I want. An example, a thing of example problems will load on Vanco Hall. They're gonna all show up for me now, but you can see when they show up. Um, so, yep, today, September 2nd at 3.50, hidden otherwise, and a problem will show up. I recommend between now and Friday, take a look at them, try doing it. Just see if you can do it. It'll be similar to homework, similar to exams. And then Friday's class, I'm just gonna go through and I'm going to solve those problems. When I solve them, I'll record them like usual and I will now then go and um, post it on the video on YouTube and put the link we right there. Um, Paul, homework is open now. Homework is always open. You can access all the homework. Um, but yes, you've done everything you need for homework for chapter 20. So the first homework is due one week from today. I always finish chapters Wednesday. The homework will be due the following Wednesday. And so you can start homework chapter 20 whenever you want. I've covered everything you need for it. Um, but it's due a week from today. Any other questions? No, nope, all set here. Okay. Well, I will stop there, let you off eight minutes early. Um, have a good day. And um, yeah, I'll talk to you guys later. I'm about to start office hours, but probably sign off for 10 minutes before them because I have extra 10 minutes. See you. All right. Yeah.